Hello, this is Liam Hanlon. Um, I'm going to talk about evolution. I'm going to be specifically um, debunking a particular article that I've seen. It's one of the latest articles to come out about evolution. Um, I talk about evolution on Twitter, on my Twitter. It's uh, My name's just Liam Hanlon. That's what my name is on YouTube just now as well. Um, the at on Twitter is at LPHanlon84, so if anyone wants to talk about evolution or anything, that's way to get me. Um, now, I've put stuff on about Twitter and then I've ended up debating with people, and um, I feel like I've pinned them down on a few things, but then what happens is like they change the parameters of what it actually means. Um, so anyway, I'll give you an example, right? I was debating them one time and I said, right, okay, so what's your example of a new species then? Right, give me an example of a new species. Evidence that we have that one species can give birth to a new species and they say they're like, right? Now, at that time I was thinking in my mind that evolution was to do with the environment as well. Uh, how animals react in their environment, uh, how they react to the environment. My thinking, my basic kind of thinking was that an animal will survive if it's if you're better adapted to your environment. If you're better adapted to your environment than the other animals competing against you, then you will be the dominant animal or you'll be an animal which survives well. Okay, so that was what I was thinking. So let's come to a liger then. This is what they said was an example of one species giving birth to a new species. And a liger is a hybrid between a male lion and a female tiger, right? Now, and what they probably don't know a lot about ligers is that they're very, very genetically recessive. They've got a lot of medical ailments and uh, things through their lives. They suffer from gigantism. So that means that they continue to grow throughout their lives. Um, in fact, so much so I think that they don't allow these things. What happens is these things only occur in the zoo. Lions and tigers are not attracted to each other in the wild. They don't have sex in the wild. Ligers are not born in the wild. So there we go. That's and one reason that I'm not an example of a new species because they don't even occur in the wild in the natural environment. It's zoos that bring them together for marketing reasons and it's considered to be unethical as well because every time that a liger is born the mother dies because they have to do a c-section on the mother because the liger is so big compared to the mother, a female tiger. Um, so the mother dies every time that a, a liger is born so again, um, totally flies in the face of being a better survivor, a better survivor in your uh, in your environment. If the mother has to die every single time that one thing is born, then this obviously isn't a successful process that's going to eventually turn one animal to another animal or whatever it might be. Um, now, ligers suffer from gigantism, and as I say, they only occur in zoos. So what happens is they get to a certain stage in their development and they're massive, they're giant and then they put them down. They've never actually let one of these things go through to the full extent of its life because just they simply grow too big and it's, it's dangerous. Ligers are actually more aggressive as well than normal um, other big cats. Um, okay, right. So that's what I'm saying. That can't possibly be an example of a new species or an example of evolution because it's not a successful species that it would never survive in the wild according to those circumstances. And I'll just show you an example of the gigantism thing here. Here it is here, right? Look at the size of that that big thing's head. Okay, so anyway, they're impressive animals but that's not the point of what we're talking about. And so because I was saying about the environment, right, about well ligers couldn't survive in their environment they're not a new species either anyway, they're still a cat, it's it's still a big cat, it's not a new species, but anyway, so they were wrong on both counts, but, so then they started to change the parameters and they said, oh no, it's not to do with your environment, how you survive in your environment, it's just that species change over time, and that's it. So that's what they said to me, so let's, before I go on and say that I'm going to debunk this in particular research that I found, most recent research, let's define some terms before we move on in the interest of fairness. 
Okay, so Darwinism, right, this is one of the most succinct sentences that I found because it's actually, see, when you actually go and you research evolution and you look into it, it's very, very, there's not a lot of succinct statements that you can focus on and say, okay, that's what evolution is. It seems like evolutionists themselves are having, having a hard time explaining their theory, putting it across and defining it. Okay, so Darwinism is a theory of biological evolution developed by Charles Darwin and others stating that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive and reproduce. Right, and that kind of backs up what I was saying about the Liger. A Liger couldn't possibly compete, survive and reproduce um, and survive as an animal species in the wild, uh, with the circumstances that I explained. Okay, so now let me go to this. That's Darwinism is not a, not a definition of evolution, but it basically is. Now, so let's just get a bog standard evolution definition then. Right, okay. So evolution, also known as descent with modification, is the change in heritable phenotype traits of biological populations over successive generations. So, it's descent with modification, that's what it is. Now, let me take you to this um, study that I found online that I'm going to debunk here. Um, putting the fin and finger it's on the mail online, so you can, if you're doubting what I'm saying or you want to check up on what I'm saying, you can come yourself and you can look on the mail online and read into it yourself to compare to what I'm saying. So putting the fin and finger, that's the title of it. Right. So what is this study, right? An ancient relationship between fins and fingers has been discovered by paleontologists. The experts claim to have unraveled the evolutionary changes needed for ancient lobe-finned fish to turn underwater pectoral fins into strong, bony structures. Until now, scientists were unsure exactly how this happened but the latest research shows that certain species of fish have the genes needed to turn fins into wrists, fingers, ankles and toes. So if you notice that already, they're saying full admittance, until now they had absolutely no idea how fish would have came up onto the land. This is basically what we're talking about here. Is it possible that fish came out of the sea up onto the land? And they're basically saying here, 22nd of December 2014, until now, they had no idea how that happened. But they're saying this late, latest research is going to, going to explain that, right? And where is this study coming out of? Just to let you know, it's Dr. Neil Schumann at the University of Chicago. Right, so I'm just going to get the bits that I find important. Okay, so they began by attempting to compare the shape of fins and limb bones, but these tests proved unsuccessful. So what they're saying there is they looked at the limb bones, I don't know, it doesn't explain in detail, various animals it could be between a fish's fin, right, and limb bones. They just looked at them and there was no comparison. It didn't prove anything, right. Okay, they're saying here that a limb is split into three sections, a stylopod, a zygopod and an autopod. So let me just take and show you that. Okay, so there's a stylopod. An example of a stylopod is a femur. An example of a zygopod is a tibia. An example of an autopod is your wrist, your ankle, your fingers and your toes. So they're connecting the joint bone that moves and the smaller bones in the, in the fingers. Stylopod, zygopod, autopod, that's what they're proving here. Or are they? Okay, so I'll take you down. Okay, so they looked at the um, fish fin bones and bones of various animals and it produced no results just by directly looking at them. Okay, so I'll take you down here. Right, it starts to get more detailed down here. Um, right, but it doesn't... It it doesn't actually explain what they done, right? What this study actually done. So, I'll tell you what they done. You don't read all this. Uh, that doesn't tell you what they done, right? That's elitist, that's an intellectual elitism, all this kind of stuff in here. It tells you down here what they actually done, right? To 
find out about these limb bones and fish fins, they inserted the genes from a fish into a developing mouse. Right, okay, so they inserted genes from a fish into a, like a mouse fetus, right? Straight away, I would say that's discounted as evidence of evolution because evolution is what happens in the natural environment and people injecting things, creating a whole process in a lab and physically injecting things is so far away from evolution it's actually the complete opposite it's actually evidence of an intelligent designer if someone who is smart creates a process and manipulates a process then that is intelligent design that doesn't mean that I would discount automatically every single study that was done in a lab, I would judge it on its individual merits. It's supposed to be that if you do a test, it's recreatable by, it could be recreatable by any other scientist who wanted to do it, and then that scientist would be able to come up with the exact same results that you got in your lab, and that is what's supposed to be real science, right? A definition of experiment conditions. If you're trying to explain the evolution of what happens in the natural environment, I don't think that you can go about inserting genes into something to prove that. That's the complete opposite. But anyway, we'll give them a chance and we'll carry on. Okay, so first they tested the ability of genetic switches in teleosts. Right, okay. And they found that fish control switches. I'll try and get that away. They found that the fish control switches did not trigger any activity in the autopod or the mouse in general. So they injected the genes of a teleost into a mouse that was developing into a mouse fetus, and um, there was no correlation between that and what they were trying to prove. So they found that that did not trigger any activity. So. At that point, they said, "All right, teleosts are not suitable for this." Okay, so this time they inserted the genes from a garfish into a developing mouse, and this time the researchers discovered that the garfish switches caused patterns of activity that were nearly indistinguishable from those driven by the mouse genome. So what they're saying is, they injected this garfish into the mouse genome genes of the garfish was nearly indistinguishable from that of the, the mouse genome, right? Um, the correlation between the fins and the fingers, right? So, what did they actually do then? Okay. The autopot building switches from agar are able to drive gene activity shown in purple in the digits of transgenic mice. An activity that was not spotted in any other fish groups, right? Okay, so what they're saying is that they injected the garfish genes into the mouse and it um, resembled the autopod. It showed resemblance towards an autopod, right? But to be honest, that's not even very conclusive because they're not just trying to prove an autopod, they're trying to prove a stylopod, a zoogopod, and an autopod, and they haven't done that. All they've done is say that we injected. We manipulated the situation and we found out that a garfish's genes are similar when they were injected into the genes of a mouse to the autopod. Well, is that is that good enough for us to say that now we are sure how fish came up onto the land? Is that good enough in December 2014 to say that, oh right, that is good enough to say they'll even take you down, look this is the kind of things that they hit you with, right? Drawings. Drawings aren't scientific. Okay, so you've got your nice wee, uh, just in case you're, you know you're not smart enough to, to recognise, you've got this drawing to manipulate your mind and stop your simple mind from thinking, oh that's not possible. You know, here's a nice wee drawing for you to say, oh, um, oh it is possible after all, you know, how scientific, right? So this thing here, this thing here, it's just at any moment it's going to turn into a zoogopod, an autopod and a stylopod. Right, oh, is it? So let me then take you to agar, right? Agarfish. Let's look at what agarfish actually is. Gars or garpike are members of the Lepisos 
deformes or semi non deformes, an ancient order of ray finned fish. Fossils from this order are known from the late Crustaceous onwards, right? So what that means is, let's go and look at the Crustaceous. The Crustaceous was a maximum that they are seeing officially of 145 million years ago, so this, so Gars, right? Gars have actually been on the Earth possibly 145 million years, and all they have ever given birth to is other Garfish. There's n absolutely zero evidence that they can do anything other than give birth to garfish. Right, I'll even show you here an alligator gar, right? Blah blah blah. Okay, gars are often referred to as primitive fishes or living fossils. So that means that basically they've been the same given birth to nothing but garfish since 145 million years ago. They're considered to be living fossils, but, right? So there's no actual evidence in the real world that these things can turn their, turn anything into limbs, can do anything but give birth to other garfish. We've got 145 million years of this evidence that all they do is give birth to garfish, but apparently if you inject the genes from a teleost into a mouse and that doesn't prove anything, okay that's fine, you just go on to the next thing, then you go on to a garfish and you inject that into a mouse and that looks similar when you inject their genes into a fetus of a mouse. That is evidence of evolution, right? Supposedly. So let's go back to Darwinism. Just to re recap, and it, it's through natural selection of small inherited variations to increase an individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. Well, we know fine well that garfishes can survive, compete, and reproduce better than anything because they've been on the earth for possibly 145 million years and they're successful survivors exactly the way they are. There would be no need for them to change, but, you know, injecting their, uh, their genes into a mouse is evolution in 2014. That's right, 2014, 22nd of December. That, that until now, scientists were to were unsure exactly how it happened. Experts claim to have unravelled the evolutionary changes needed for ancient lobe-finned fish to turn underwater pectoral fins into strong bony structures. Until now, scientists were unsure exactly how that happened. Until now, of course. Well, I think I'm not even a scientist and I feel like I've debunked that. Okay, I'm going to send this to the University of Chicago, see if I can get a reply out of their uh, science team, their science department. Um, see if they'll respond and give them at least give them the right to reply to what I'm saying. I'll just tell them I've done a critique. If you want to find out what happened with it, you could check up on my Twitter or you could uh, I'll maybe make another video to update people about what happened. Okay, right, thanks then. Have a nice day. Bye.